Validation? Okay. So we'll go in and I'll, I'll download it and we'll pick up on that and <clears throat> then we're going to extend it a bit. All right. So, oh, this guy in the keyboard and mouse. All right, so let me go and download it. And now I think about it, it is Thursday. I was just in a meeting, and that's why I was a couple minutes late. And I was the one disagreeing with everyone. So maybe there is something about this Thursday business being, you know, a day for everyone to be disagreeable. Well, for me, it's, for, for me, it's my Friday. I think. So I'm kind of like, a, oh, you know, getting ready for the weekend and all the, all the craziness that entails. Big difference between the week and the weekend for me. On the week, I fall asleep on, on the couch watching Netflix around midnight. And on the weekend, I fall asleep on my couch watching Netflix at about 2 in the morning. So, huge difference between how I am during the week and in the weekend. All right, let's pull up the example we had from last time. <coughs> and I'm going to expand this guy. And... Oh, that's how, that's how I show the, the client-side validation. I'll go and open it. Go to Visual Studio. And open this. so quiet. You, you, you're doing the Vulcan mind meld? Or? Oh boy. <laughs> Alright, so let's run this guy and just to refresh our memory for where we were. And again, you know, I realize this is little bit uh, hip hypocritical, but um, you ought to um, make your pages look like a completed web page. So I'm not doing much about the appearance of it because that's not the focus of the class today. And I don't necessarily want um, to uh, obscure what we're really talking about. So I do expect you, as part of your finished work, to have it look like a completed page. So I think what we left off last time is we have our text box. I put in a miles or kilometers. Yeah, Ooh, I forgot which kilometers. One. Put in kilometers and I get how many miles it is. If I don't put anything in, I get must enter a value. If I put garbage in, I get must enter a number. But we don't make the previous number disappear. We don't make the previous number disappear. That is correct. Um, and that, that's a good point. Um, to, to do that, you would, you would need to do that on the client side, remember, because um, that validation control of JavaScript is enabled is running on the client side. So I would have to put a little snippet of the code in to clear that out. And I'm not sure if it's really worth it or not. I, I don't know. I'd have to decide. Now, I'm going to go and rearrange this just a smidge. I'm going to put the two validators next to each other, because I had the two validators on opposite sides of the label. I will set the display property of both validators to dynamic. What that means is if you set it to dynamic, 
it will only take up the space if it needs it. If it doesn't need the space, it won't take it up. So that's dynamic and this one's dynamic. I think that's both of them. Okay. And I am going to put a little bit of stuff in here. Now notice I'm not using labels for these. Could I use labels for them? Yes. Why would I not use labels for them? I just I just went in and put um, I just went in and put um, the HTML code for it. Oops. So I'm not going to program anything with it, right? Um, the big advantage of using the ASP.NET control is that you can do something and dynamically um, change it uh, based on certain conditions. So the label for the results, I made a label. Why? Because I want to program that. I want to be able to put something in there. So based on the calculation, I want to put the results there. So it makes sense to put that as a label. Right now, anyhow, the way this application stands, enter kilometers is always enter kilometers. And therefore, there's really no reason to make that a label. I'm not going to change it. Now, I could change it, for example, if I wanted to localize my website. That is, if I had code that would set the labels based on the country. All right? Maybe, um, you know, instead of location, if I was doing it in German or Spanish or whatever, I'd have a different word in there. In which case, I could make that programmable. I could do something where I pull a list of labels from a database or from an XML file or something and dynamically change that to say, you know, enter kilometers in whatever language I wanted to. Or, if I wanted to do something like you folks did on lab two, I think it was, where you select from a drop down in that case, you selected from a drop-down which page you wanted to see. I could do something where I selected from a drop-down what uh, conversion I wanted to do, for example. Maybe kilometers to miles, miles to kilometers. All right. In which case, um, I could, um, you know, I, I could dynamically change that to say enter miles. And I could change the second one to say enter kilometers. So, again, the idea of using the ASP.NET controls is we use them the real benefit of using them comes in when you can program them. All right. Um, as far, at least as far as labels go. All right. So I'm going to go and run this. Let's look at the code behind. Oops. Code behind again. You click the little arrow to get to the file, and we can see. I check to see if it's valid. I do that just in case uh, JavaScript is disabled on a particular um, particular setting. Here, if it does run server side, I could put code in to blank that out, but again, I'm not going to worry about that right now. If it's valid, I grab kilometers from the text box. I do my calculation and I stuff the miles back in the label. All right? Fair enough? Good to go? Questions about this? All right. Let's go and let's let's say we're talking about two dimensions instead of one dimension. Right? This allowed us to convert one length. Let's say we had to convert two lengths. We were talking about like rectangular plots of land and we wanted to convert um, what is, you know, how many miles is a two kilometer by 0.5 kilometer plot of land. Alright, we'd want to see that in miles. So we have two numbers. 
to convert. What do we have to do to, to make that happen? Well, we have to add another text box. Notice how nice it is for us that as I paste it, it figured out, hey, I already got a text box one, I'm going to make it a text box two. All right. Um, I can even copy these validators because the validation is going to be the same, right? And it even changed the name of the validator. Well, kind of. What do you think I'm going to have to change about this validator? The control to validate. Because it probably just copied that, and sure enough, it did. So I can go and change that to text box 2. And I'm thinking we're good to go. I can make a, another label for the result. I just as well could have done this in graphical view and copied and pasted or dragged a new label or whatever. So let's run this. I type in 23 by 31. Or 32. And it does the one conversion. I put in bogus data here. It tells me. And so on. Got to look to see why that is. I'm going to put this button down here. Alright, let's try that. All right, that's, that's a little better. So, you know, 4 by 4 kilometers, converted 4 to 2.5, but it didn't do the second one. All right. So, how are we going to make it to do the second one? All right, I have to go to the coat behind and do the C sharp. So, okay, we can copy this. And we can paste it, and we can change it to text box 2. We can change that to label 2. All right. Now. You don't need to make another kilometer or miles? No, I don't really need to make another kilometer or miles because those are just sort of like, work. those are like my scratch pad. Those are doing my calculation, and those, will change so those will change anyhow. So that's just like my scratch pad where I'm doing the calculations. So now I can go and say, give me a 2 by 3 kilometers would be 1.25 by 18 points, or 1.875, which I assume is correct. All right. Now, if any of you watch, either, maybe you guys watched it as a kid. I don't know. I watched it as, um, I'm not sure if I was out of college or still in college at the time. Maybe you watched Pee Wee's Playhouse. All right. Immediately I get a laugh that seems to apply that some of you had. What did he have every week that, well, I'll just, I'll just tell you. Yeah, yeah, the magic word. word. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. What happens when you said the magic word on Pee Wee's Playhouse? The whole Pee Wee went crazy. Everyone went crazy and you at home were supposed to scream. I went crazy. Now, yeah, that's a shocker. All right. Now. How subversive is that, by the way? Make a kid show for Saturday mornings where you encourage the kid to go crazy and scream where their poor, beaten down dads and moms are probably trying to get, like, sleep in a little bit. That, that's brilliant, you know. But at any rate, the idea was when the, you saw that, you were supposed to go crazy. Here is a programmer's equivalent of Pee Wee's Magic Word. All right? The programmer's equivalent of Pee Wee's Magic Word is looking at this and seeing code that is in essence duplicated, right? If I took my well, if I took my glasses off, I won't be able to see it at all. 
But if I don't look too closely at this, that looks like the same code. If I have to look closer to say, oh, well, the one pulls it from text box one and stuffs it in label one, the second one pulls it from text box two and stuffs it in label two. Okay, yeah, they are different. But in essence, they're the same. In essence, they're the same. So when you see that as a programmer, you should scream. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, do that. You're, you're allowed to do that. So go ahead and scream once. <laughs> okay. Uh, and if it happens again in class, you're welcome to. The kids at home can do it too. The kids at home can do that too. Right, if you're, if you're watching this. Thank you for, for pointing that out. For the record, I'm not going to come in in a too small gray suit and red <laughs> bow tie. And, that outfit for Pee-wee is okay. You still want the other Pee-wee outfit. Yeah, well, we're not going there. All right. Yeah, we're not going there. <laughs> All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is where I was, wish I would be teaching the multimedia class. I just have like, you know, it would just go blank for a second and then it would, it would kick back in. At any rate, this is duplicated. So the problem is we have duplicate code. And what is wrong with duplicated code? Okay. What is it bad for? For maintainability. For maintainability. Right. That's, that's what right. So, the code. Pardon me? The code. Exactly. So, for example, now, granted, miles to kilometers, that's, that's a, a constant number, and that's not going to change. I mean, those are defined things, and the world would go crazy if they changed that, right? But let's imagine this being, let's say, a shipping calculation, or a sales tax calculation, or really any other calculation that was, um, you know, prone to being changed, right? You know, if you ship something via UPS, right now the rates are calculated one way. Two months from now, they might be calculated some other way. So let's imagine this, instead of being um, a simple, straightforward, probably never changing calculation, to something that is much more volatile, much more real world. And let's imagine this being a more complex calculation as well, that's prone for bugs. I mean, I could look at that and say, yeah, that code's right, all right? But if I had a calculation in there to calculate shipping from Elyria to Kansas City, you know, would I know for sure that code is right? No, it would require some testing. Am I liable to make some error in the, in the calculation? Yeah, I might make some error in the calculation, all right? So, imagine I got this wrong, and imagine I put in 635 in this simple example. But again, in a bigger example, it would be a more subtle error that I'd be more likely to make. I have duplicated code, and if I go in and test this, and realize it's wrong, all right? Oh, let me go and fix that. I'm not careful. I change it there. I'm getting now inconsistent results. All right, so for the first one, it shows the correct value. For the second one, it shows an incorrect value. So I would have to know and find, track down every instance of this code, of this snippet of code if it's duplicated, and change every <coughs> one of them. Or again, if the calculation got more complex, if there were if statements and stuff like that, I'd have to go in and track down every instance of it. And it could be worse than that, right? Because we're right now we're talking about one page, all right, one page. So I'd have to change it in two places. Could you imagine if this was like part of a bigger site where you had, um, you know, where, where you had your fitness calcul uh, fitness tracker, where you kept track of workouts and you, on every page you had the opportunity to display kilometers or miles. Every page would have this little calculation built into it so you could just click a switch and do that. If you did that then, you're going to make mistakes, all right? So, Repeated code is bad because it's harder to maintain. If the calculation 
or the process changes, you have to change it in multiple places. That's more work for you, and it leaves open the chance of inconsistency. All right? Yes? In this instance, could you just set your variable declaration double miles equals to kilometers times <coughs> 0.625, so you didn't have to duplicate miles equals kilometers times miles equals kilometers times? You mean do this? Miles equals... No. The reason it is, is this would be a static assignment. In other words, this would assign miles, the values of kilometers, at the instant that this statement executed. Gotcha. It wouldn't go back and if I changed kilometers, it would go and recalculate miles. Gotcha. All right. So no, that, that really wouldn't help. Good thought. Good thought because you're putting it in one place. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Now, I could do this. This would be a step up. All right? It's not a perfect solution, but this would be a step up. I could say, this is kind of dovetailing on your thing. Yeah. Kilometer two miles equals 0.625. And then instead of having hard-coded 0.625, I could say km to miles. Oh, thanks. So this is better, right? Because if I got it wrong, it's wrong on both of them. which means that to correct it, I just have to correct it in one of them, in one place. So I'm testing this, I look and I see, oh, that's not right. I go in and, oh, okay. And again, keep in mind this is a, a simple example, and but, you know, the same notions apply in more complicated examples. All right, yeah, that's more like it. Okay, so that's one thing I could do, and that, that makes this more maintainable. Again, keep in mind that this one statement could be a bunch of statements. So even doing that still doesn't make us good code. It makes it better, though. And again, sometimes you know, sometimes there's multiple ways to do the same thing that are virtually the same, that are virtually even. And, and I may prefer one way, you may prefer another, but objectively I can't say my way is better. It's just the way that it's clear to me or makes more sense to me. The change I just made is objectively a better way to code this. Why? Because it's easier to maintain. So objectively, this change that I just made of creating a variable and storing that value in that variable is objectively better than the way I did it the first time. What's another thing I could do along the same thoughts? Because someone, not me, could do something like this. I set to private. If I set it to private, it could only be seen in that function and it'd still be able to protect it, same thing. No, that well, yeah, on that line of thinking there's only public left, but almost every programming language has something called a constant. And what I can do is say that this is a constant. Now look, I can't go and change that in my code. So again, you know, 
this, this is another case of where I'm going to um, use a kid show analogy. This is like SpongeBob, where you have to use your imagination. All right. Imagine a more complex, involved calculation with a lot of things going on. It would be hard to mess this one up because it's so simple. But if you imagine a bigger chunk of code, it would be very possible that I could inadvertently set a variable wrong, thinking that I needed to set it when in reality it was a constant. By making it a constant, that requires a compiler to check to make sure that you're not trying to change the value. Okay, so we've nudged this in a direction, and again, this is objectively better than this, but we're still not quite there yet. Because what if, for example, we had to, you know, we added a drop down to this or whatever. The better answer for this is to put this in a function. All right? A function. A function takes input and gives you output. Functions don't always have to take input, and they don't always have to give output. But as a general rule, functions can take input and they can give output. So there's a square root function in Excel. What's the, what is the input to a square root function in Excel? It, I'm sure it ain't changed. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> a value, the value that you want the square root of. What does it return? The square root. The square root. So it returns the, the answer, whatever the answer might be. Um, those of you that have had CISS 121, there is a payment function in that. All right. What are the arguments to the payment function in Excel? Or if you, if you don't know, if you haven't used this function, what would you need to do to calculate the payment on a loan? What would you need to know? The interest rate. The interest rate. The how long the loan is for. How often the payments are. How often the payments are. And how much you owe. All right. So, if you had a loan officer in a bank, if you go up to them and you say, how much is my loan going to be? How, how much is each payment on my loan going to be? Can they answer that question? No. You have to say, well, how much would it be if I <coughs> borrowed $1,000 for two years, I make monthly payments, and oh yeah, the percentage of interest rate is, you know, 6% or whatever. Then they can calculate and tell you the interest rate. Functions are like that. Functions need to be provided with the ingredients to do their thing. All right? Functions can take one argument, or no arguments, or multiple arguments. What would be an example of a function that didn't require any arguments? Well, that's no return. Give a real example of a function that accepts no arguments. How about a function that tells me what today's date is? All right? Today's date. What day is today? And it doesn't have any arguments because that's enough to answer the question. What's today's day? And let's say it's September 18th? Ish. Ish? Yeah. All right. So we give you that answer. A function can only return one of something. It can return nothing, or it can return one of something. All right? We won't talk about functions that don't return anything right at this point. But essentially, a function that doesn't return anything would be like just saying, print this document. Even that could possibly return a value saying, true, it worked, false, it did. Yeah, out of papers, printer status, whatever. So maybe that's not even a good example. So we'll focus on functions that return something. 
Whatever it is a function returns, it can only return one of them. All right? Which means that if a function returns a double, it can return one double. That's it. Can't return two doubles. But you can call it a function. But I can call that function as many times as I want. But each, each call to that function will only return one, um, one uh, double. Now, things can get tricky when you start talking about returning objects. All right? Um, we won't talk about that right at this point, but one thing that you can do if you need to return a bunch of information is return one object that contains that. For example, let's say I had a function in Elsie's computer system, I was doing some kind of application, and I had get student information. What might be the argument to that function? What would be the argument to get student information? The student ID number, right? Because if I went and said, if I went to records, let's say, and assuming that this was legal, if I said, what was the name of that student? And they'd go, well, which student? We have 20,000 of them. And you'd say, okay, well, the student who has a student number of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Oh, that is... Now, what if I said, give me all the information about that student? Again, assuming that was legal and didn't violate FERPA or HIPAA or whichever law it is. But they give me all the information about this student. They give me a bunch of different things, right? They give me the name, they give me the address, email address, phone number, major, blah, 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 blah. Does that violate the rule of a function returning one thing? Because I'm returning a bunch of things. No. no. Why not? Because you can set all of those things to one specific return. And then within that, you return that one thing, but within that one thing is everything. You exactly. In that case, I would return a student object. And that student object would include attributes for all those different things. The point I'm trying to make is you can only return one of something. But that one thing that you can return can be complicated and can take like a lot of subparts. Right. But, only, but only one. Now, things could get even more confusing because could I write a function that gave me all the students' information for the students enrolled in this class? Could I? Yeah. Yes. How would I, what would, what would be the argument? Uh, an array. Okay, that would be the return value, would be an array. The argument input would be student number. Well, or, or class number, yeah, or the, 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 the argument would be the class number or the section number or whatever. Yeah. The return would be an array of student objects. Like right, right. You but that? again, you're returning one thing, one, thing, yeah. one yeah. list. So you got you to gotta sort of take that. It can only return one thing a little bit <coughs> loosely. Yeah. All right. For now, we're going to keep it simple. For now, we're going to keep it simple, and we're just going to be returning a double. But do keep in mind, and this will probably become relevant later on, that we can return, when I say we return one thing, that one thing that gets returned can be complicated and can have a lot of pieces. In this case, I'm going to write a function to convert kilometers to miles. All right? What will my argument be? I've taken kilometers, and what will my output be? Miles. Right. So, in this case, um, I would accept as input <coughs> kilometers. I would produce miles. What would be the data types of those arguments? So, They'd both be double. Because you need a, sometimes you need a decimal point. So. All right. I'm going to take those miles, though, and put them in a text box. So why not make the return value a string? I guess you could. You'd have to do the conversion within the... Uh... What would be good or bad about that? What would be good or bad about, about um, returning a string that contained a number of miles as opposed to returning a double? Because you're assuming that the browser will... Uh, 
What if I wanted to use that number somewhere else? For example, what if in addition to doing a calculation uh, in conversion, I wanted to display how many square miles that is? If I were to return a string, You'd have to convert it again. I'd have to convert it again and that would be a mess. So, what if, and again, I'm full of what ifs today, all right? What if, in, what I, or let me ask this. Could I give the function as an argument a string? Could I give, could I call this function, this hypothetical function with text box one text a string? Not if you want a calculation. Well, I could convert it, right? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Is that a good idea? No, why not? Not well, if you want to convert it. Well, well, I could convert it. I mean, I'm converting it here. I could have that same code in there. The, 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 the more complete answer is, in this case, my function is getting a value that originally started its life out as a string. How do I know for sure that going forward, every other occurrence of it is going to be starting its life off as a string that I have to convert. All right? I don't. All right? I may, for example, let's do a hypothetical. I could sort of chain functions together, and let's say I wanted to convert meters to miles. In that case, I could have a convert meters to kilometers function that would return a double, then use that double, which is not a string, to call the convert kilometers to miles. All right? So I don't have the value coming from a string. Here's the bigger point here. This is my event handler. The event handler is responsible for this. Gathering the necessary input. Calling the appropriate function and then finally doing something with the result. Now, keep in mind, I'm not talking about necessarily, this is, this is focusing on event handlers here. Typically, and again, I told you when I say always, I mean almost always, all right? But typically, your event handler is going to do this. It's going to gather the necessary input. It's going to call the appropriate function, then it's going to do something with the results. Now, I might repeat that a few times, all right? In this case, it's going to repeat that process twice, all right? But... I'm going, to re I'm going to do this code. I'm going to do these steps. The appropriate function knows what it needs and what it's going to return based on, you know, the, the rules of the function, what, what the function is trying to do. Now, the other thing, part of this gathering is doing any converting that's needed. So in this case, the converting is to convert the kilometers uh, from the string in the text box to the double kilometers. And doing something with the results may also involve converting. Essentially, the event handler is going to sort of Format the request the way the function needs it, call the function, and then do something with the results. So let's take a stab at writing the function. I'm going to go and take and move some code around, and then we'll go back, and when we're done, we'll visit this description and make sure that, um, um, make sure that what we did fits this model and we, we understand how it is. 
Because this is a simple case, but even with bigger, more extensive cases, this is what you're going to be doing. All right. So first of all, let me go and make a function. And I'm going to make it a protected function. What do I def define next when I define a function in C sharp? The return type. The return type. And we said this is going to return a double. What do I define next? The name, the name of the function. Convert. I'm going to say convert km to miles. Do you not want that in the button clicker then, then? Oh, no, so we're just going to be calling it, aren't we? Yeah. We're not, we're not quite there yet. We're doing it pieces at a time. Eventually, yeah, we'll call it from the on click. And then what do I need here within the parentheses? The inputs and the arguments, the list of arguments that I need. Now, how many arguments does this function need? Two or one? Well, we have two things that we have to convert. Right. So we only need one. So we only need one, and we'll call it twice. Right. Now, again, that's a good that's a good um, um, answer, and I want to make sure we understand why I'm not writing with two arguments. Why do you think I'm not writing it with two arguments? Because the user doesn't always have to put in two. Because if I'm thinking reuse, there might be a case where the person has three distances that they want to convert. Or there might be a case where they have one distance that they want to convert. I shouldn't have to fake and, and uh, uh, you know, put a dummy value in if, if they only have one. The other thing, and the other problem is, is I can only return one double from this. If I gave two values, I'd have to sort of figure out a way to return two doubles. Not that I couldn't do it, but much simpler instead to define a function that has a very specific purpose. Generally speaking, the more specific and the more well-defined a function is, the more reusable it's going to be. So convert kilometers to miles is going to be very reusable. Convert two kilometers into two miles is going to be less likely to be reused. So in here I define the argument type. I'm going to give it a double. And I'll call it argkm. All right. I generally put arg in front of my arguments just so that I, I remember that they're arguments. All right. It's just a convention. Um, it's good to have naming conventions. Sometimes people like to put the variable type in front of it. You know, whatever. Um, the most important thing is that you adopt. You, whatever you do, you do it in a, in, a, in a pretty consistent manner. So, do I need this up here? Do I need this code up here? All right. And I'll delete this one. All right. Kilometers in this example, I'm getting from the text box. Should this function pull it from the text box? No. We want this function to be versatile enough to get it from anywhere. Well, we're already giving that as argument km. So I don't even need a variable for km. I can simply say what here? Arg km. All right. I do need to declare double, uh, uh, miles down here. Do I want to put what outside or? We'll talk about that when we're done with the function. All right, because that's, that's a great question, but let's talk about that when we're done. Now, what's the last thing I want to do? Why do I have the, the red squiggly? Because I'm not returning anything. So I could say return miles. 
Now, I have a function that takes an argument of a double that represents the amount of uh, kilometers I have, and it returns a double. All right, and it does a calculation, and it looks like it's good, but we're going to test it. Right? Now, here we've defined the function. That simply says, hey, when I say convert kilometers to miles, I need to give it the kilometers as a double, and I'm going to get back the miles. So I've defined what that means, but I haven't done it yet. To do it, I have to call that function. And this is where I call the function from inside the event. So, what am I going to do here? Right. And then put the text box one inside. Okay, well, KM equals what? What am I doing here in the event handler? That's the input. What am I, if you remember the three steps I had on the board, I'm gathering the input. Yeah. What is going to be one of the input values to this function? The text box. Text box one. So, kilometers equals text box one dot text except that's not right right what do I have to do well convert to double and at this point we will let Jesse and Alan argue for 10 minutes about if that's the best way to do it or not <laughs> all right so I convert that to, 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 to double I then say miles equals what? <coughs> Convert km to miles. And I give it km as the argument. What do I do next? I say label one dot text equals miles to string. All right, and that's the first one. Now, let's look at this. Can we read the, yeah, we can read the code and see this. So what am I doing? I'm gathering the necessary input, and I'm converting it if necessary. So I'm grabbing the first kilometer that I want to convert, and I'm converting it because this function expects a double, but the place where the kilometers is stored is a text box, which means it's text. I then call the appropriate function. I'm giving it what it needs, the kilometers, and I'm saving the return value. That's one thing I didn't say up here, but it was sort of implied is that I need to save the return value. So, I'm calling a function, I'm giving it what it needs, and I'm saving the return value in the appropriate kind of variable. Then, the last thing I do is I go and I do something with the results. I'm going to put it on that label. And in order to do that, we have to do some conversion. Right, because um, the, the label's expecting a string and I have a double. So, I followed these steps, probably in the most simplest variation possible. You know, a function could require three or four different inputs. What I do with the results might be some other calculation. But again, in general scheme of things, I followed that, that paradigm. Now, what I would suggest doing is, let's test it after one. Not a big deal, and I'm pretty confident that this works, but I'm always a firm believer of doing a project incrementally, taking and, and doing a little piece of it before moving on. So let's go and run this. Enter kilometers. 10, 
And I'll put a value in there just because it needs a value. And it gives me 6.25. So it seems to be working. Now, we do the same thing for label text box 2 and label 2 and run it. Here's the ironic thing. I added more code. There's more code in this than there was in my original solution. Does that mean that it is worse? Absolutely not. This is better written code. All right? Because it's more reusable. I add a drop down to select. Let's go and do that. Let's add a third miles, but let's put the values in a drop down instead. All right? Let me go here and I will put a drop down and I'm going to add items. We'll make this simple. We'll just do like one to five. third label all right so now I want to go and I want to call this again so I'm going to copy this this is going to be label three because that's where I'm putting the results where do I get the KM from? The drop down. So what would the syntax be? Drop down one, list one. Selected value. This one, coincidentally, we could also use selected index because I made them 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But I would say the better practice would be selected value. And of course I get an error. Why am I getting an error? Yeah, because the selected value attribute of a dropdown is a text field, right? Because in my case I have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I could just as well have um, A, B, C, D, Ohio, Alaska, Arkansas, whatever. So I still have to go and convert it to double. Well, you do it the same way that you do it here, with the string, with the uh, text field, I mean. Yeah, there we go. I didn't need the parentheses after it. So I grab the selected value of it, and I convert it to double. So now when I go and run this, I can say one, two, three. Well, second one's a three. That's okay. We'll let you go on that one. Seeing if you're paying attention. Good <laughs> job. All right. And it does that correctly. So let's think this through. This function doesn't care where you get the double from. You could get it from a text box, you could get it from a drop down, you could get it from radio buttons, doesn't matter. You could generate a random number. All the function cares about is that you give it a double. The function also doesn't care, care which, um, which, uh, um, what do I want to say, which, um, what it does with the output. All right. In this case, we're setting a label to an output. 
um, we could set other things to the output. Or we could do something like, let's do something, and we got, we got about 10 minutes left, and I don't want to start the next, next topic. Let's make the drop down so it shows one picture if it's a short distance and another picture if it's a long distance. Okay? So let me open paint and we can ex we can explore my artistic skills. No, we're not going to do that. All right. We're not going to do that one either. We're going to make a smiley face for short distances. For short distances. <laughs> That's meant to be happy and not like evil or something. So let me go and save it. Save it as a JPEG, let's say. And I'll call this one short. for long. Might be cursing a little bit too. Uh, uh, uh. All right. So we'll save this one as whoops, long and we'll put it on the desktop. All right, so I have my two images. I'm going to go and I'm going to put these. I put them initially on the desktop. I'm going to put them inside my apps folder because it needs to be there. I could even create an images folder and put them in that, but for now we're not going to do that. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put, and I'm just going to do this for the last one. I'm going to put an image. here. Get rid of the label. <coughs> and initially I'm going to set the visibility of this guy to false. I could, so I suppose, put a neutral, you know, a face with the line going across if it, um, until I made the, the entry. But we're going we're gonna to do this. We're going to make it invisible. So, what do we want to use as a cutoff for miles? Let's say if it's more than five miles, what am I, what am I trying to pretend? Five, so only goes up to. It only goes up to five, right. And I'd say, what am I, what am I saying too? It's like, yeah, right, like full five miles, that's a short run. No, right, right. Okay. Let's make two, let's make one and, zero, one, and two we'll say is short, three, four, and five is long. So. Well, and remember, we got to do this in miles, right? So. Then use the label text. Because that's the converted function. Well, you can use the output. Use the output of the function. So let's say I'm going to use, uh, in fact, I'm going to put that label back real quick. And I'm going to put the image on it. All right. So. If miles greater than two. If statement again can be broken down into the true part <coughs> and the false part. If this condition is true, what do we want to do? Set the label free to image. 
Well, we already, we already set the label to the number. We want to set the image image URL. Again, we're changing another property of it. The actual URL that's put there to long. And we're going to make it visible, right? Because we originally hide it. Hit it. Hide it. Hit it. Otherwise, we put the short image there. So I go and enter two, one, two, three. One point eight seven five miles is indeed short, so I display that. Let's pick five. Five is long because it's bigger than three, so I display that. So is that that's going off of the label then? Yeah. Well it's not going off the label, it's going off the miles return value. From the drop down though? Well it, it's 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 taking the value from the drop-down, converting it into miles, and whatever it gets back from that function, the, the converted miles for that drop-down, that's what it's using. Well, it's a good thing you didn't convert it to text. <laughs> right. And it's a good thing I didn't convert it to text because I need to do a comparison, a arithmetic comparison uh, for it. Again, this function's good because what's good about this function is it makes no assumptions about where the value is coming from. It's not coming from a text box or a drive. It could come from anywhere. Hey, I don't care how you come up with those numbers. I'm going to do my thing. Just give me a double, and I'll give you the answer back as a double. Likewise, I'm not returning anything but the double. Let whoever called this function decide how they want to display the results. Right? Do I want to display the results by showing a picture? Do I want to display the results by showing a, uh, a, a number? That's up to whoever calls this function. This function's job is simply to return the value, and then the function decides how it wants to deal with that result. Maybe I wouldn't display it at all. Maybe, as I said before, I'd use it in a calculation. All right? Maybe, for example, we would have a function in a weather page that says, give me the percentage of percentage chance of precipitation. I could display that as a number. I could display that as one of a series of graphics, right, of, um, you know, a, a sunny sky, a partly cloudy sky, or a dark cloudy sky. I could combine that with the temperature to show whether it's going to be snow or rain, if there's a 100% chance of precipitation or whatever. The point is, is we could present that any different way. That's not the function's job to do that. It's whoever calls the function decides what you're going to do with the output as it decides where you're going to get the input from. So, all right, pretty good. We, we made code this much more reusable if there was a bug we could fix it in that one function, and everywhere would have the benefit of it. If our calculation changed in a more realistic context, if it was a shipping calculation or something, it's isolated to change. Now, yet, we still have more to talk about. What is wrong with this function? The variables are declared within it? No, nothing wrong with that. That's like the scratch pad. Function needs a scratch pad to do the calculations. Where does this function live? Well, it lives as part of this page. What does that mean? That means if I were to create a second page and I wanted to do the same calculation, I would have duplicated code. Let me say that again. I would have duplicated code. Ah, thank you. And that's a bad thing. 
So we want to avoid having that. Because if you can imagine if I made a second page, put a second text box on there to do the calculation, you know, I would, this code lives on this page. So what we're going to do next time is look at how I can put this code somewhere that I can access it from any page I want to. <coughs> so it only lives in one place. It's, again, an extension of the idea of separating things into components. You know, we had this when we talked about CSS versus HTML. We said, okay, we're going to have our HTML component, and we're going to separate and put our CSS in another file. Why? So that CSS can be shared among different files. And if we need to change it, we change it one place. In other words, maintainability. Same thing is going to happen here. We're going to take this code, we're going to put it in its own file, and then it can be called regardless of who needs to use it. Is this cons would that be considered object-oriented? Yeah, this will be, the, what this will do is this will take this function and we will create a class for distance conversions. And everything anyone would ever want to know about distance conversions would be put in that class. So, I have a function to convert kilometers to miles. I could have a function to convert inches to feet, um, inches to kilometers, you know, whatever I wanted to do. Any function that related to that, this would be that component that anywhere I needed to do distance conversions, I'd plug that component in and all the information in the world about distance conversions would live there. And as the one-stop shop, that's the only place I'd ever need to go to do this particular piece of functionality. Well, that's what we'll do next time. All right. Questions? That there was too late. Didn't change it. Did I say it? Yeah, you said questions. I didn't say, though. But, right. but every day so far you've changed the whole saying. Just the start well, I've changed it by, by breaking it into parts. Um, I did want to see, I forgot, I didn't have time to say after Tuesday to show you assignment one because my uh, CSS wasn't working. Oh, okay. Right, right, right. So, All right. I, I couldn't leave my computer on. I only got like 9% left of the batteries. Okay. To an Apple product, that's like 30 cents. Yeah. All right. Let us adjourn to BU 2.0.